you. One of the signs uh, up here on the wall from the youth conference in the past says that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the honour of kings to search out a matter. And of course we know the word matter there is word. It's a searching out of the word of God. And that's what we're going to be doing here over the course of the next couple of days, God willing, as we explore this marvellous subject of the apocalypse in Joshua. Brothers and sisters, we know, we know that God has sown through his word the essential message of prophecy wherever you go. Whether you're in Genesis or Joshua or Judges or Kings, you find the same prophetic framework and you find really amazing detail that is quite awesome. I rarely ever use that word, but I can use it in relation to the book of Joshua. It's awesome, brothers and sisters, what we find in this scripture. Like the book of Judges, which follows it, Joshua sets forth the work of Christ in great detail. Whereas Judges covers both advents of Christ, Joshua focuses on his second advent. Now those of you who were with us a few years ago in this place, when we did Christ in the Judges, will know just how detailed the work of Christ is in the book of Judges, both first and second advent. You can even demonstrate the entire history of the Roman Catholic system and its destruction by Christ and the saints from the book of Judges. In fact, I could teach you everything about the work of Christ just from the book of Judges. That's how amazing it is. Well, you can do similar things in the book of Joshua, but the, but the focus is on his second advent, as you're going to see in our studies here over the course of the next couple of days. And this is perfectly consistent with the beginning of the book of Joshua. So come back to Joshua chapter 1 with me, if you would. Let's have a look at the first three verses of Joshua. And what do we read? Joshua 1 verse 1. Now after the death of Moses. Moses, of course, represented the law and the Mosaic system which died with Christ and was abolished on his resurrection. So this, the, this is the end, as it were, of the Mosaic system, replaced by the work, the atoning work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, he's typed here by Joshua. Joshua, we know, means Yahweh's salvation. Jesus, of course, is the anglicized, Hellenized form of Joshua. So here he is, Yahweh's salvation, in the place of the Mosaic system. And he's described here in verse 1, if you read on, as Joshua the son of Nun. Now the word son here is the common word for son in the Old Testament. The word Ben. Ben means a family builder. The son who builds a family. So here is Yahweh's salvation. He's the family builder of Nun. Nun just happens to mean in the Hebrew perpetuity. That is like eternal life. It's perpetual. It goes on forever. So here he is, the family builder of perpetuity. Now, you can see straight away, can't you? In the very first verse of the book of Joshua, we have the work of our Lord Jesus Christ spelled out in a spectacular way. And so we, we're going to see that this is the way that this book will unfold before our eyes. So what we read in the next verse, Moses, my servant, is dead, says Yahweh. Now, therefore, arise. Now, the word in the Hebrew means to arise or to stand up. And that's what the word anastasis means in the New Testament, to stand up. This is about, of course, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here he is, Yahweh's salvation, who was to arise, to replace the Mosaic order, to become our high priest, brothers and sisters. And he's told here to go over. And of course, that's the word abar, the very root of the word Hebrew, isn't it? It means to cross over. And we're going to be talking about our final crossing over in this study here uh, this morning because the title was you remember baptism of the spirit and you'll recall the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when he said except the man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God and of course our birth of water was is obvious isn't it that's baptism the birth of the spirit is our entry into eternal life Entry into the land of promise, so to speak, to have our internal inheritance. <clears throat> now, of course, there's a begettal of the Spirit. Yes, that actually precedes, doesn't it, the birth of water. A begettal. But, of course, there's got to be a gestation period. But ultimately, there's a birth. 
a birth of the Spirit. And that'll be when you and I are changed uh, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, and we think that's pretty close at hand. We saw from last night the events that, that tell us plainly that that day is close at hand. When we shall, hopefully by the grace of God, go to the right hand of our Lord Jesus Christ and in a moment together with the multitudes of the past who have been faithful, we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's what this is leading to. And this is why this study is going to be so helpful to all of us, brothers and sisters, because it will create the vision that we need. It will build up our faith. It will prepare us for the day which we know is at hand. He says to him, though, in verse 2, go over this Jordan. And we're going to see just how important Jordan is in the scheme of things as we proceed. Jordan means the descender. It is a type of human nature that carries all men to death. A little bit more about that in a moment. Thou and all this people, he says to him. So Yahshua, Yahweh's salvation would be first and then his people. And that's the order, isn't it? He first, then those who belong to him. And where are they going? Well, we read, they're going unto the land. It says, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. So it's the promised land that they're going into, just as we will, brothers and sisters, when we have been immortalized. In verse 2, of course, it speaks about the children of Israel. Again, the word children is Ben. It's the family builders of those who have prevailed with God, which is the meaning of the name Israel. Israel, of course, we often hear means the prince with God. That's not terribly accurate. It means those who prevail with God. And that, of course, is the whole purpose of the truth, isn't it, in our lives, that we might ultimately prevail with God and find his grace in that day. <clears throat> Verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you, as I said to Moses. Every place. The word has the idea of the whole, all the land, that the sole of your foot has trodden upon. This is the Abrahamic promise, isn't it? This is Genesis 13, verses 14 to 17. Walk through the land. Wherever you walk, that land I'm going to give to you. And there was a man who did that. His name was Caleb. He went into that land as a faithful spy. He came back with a good report of the land. In opposition, of course, to the ten who spoke evil of the land. So Caleb will be there in that day. And he will walk through that land as an inheritor of it with you and me, brothers and sisters, if we remain faithful. And then the final words, as I said, as I said in the Hebrew, that's the word debar. And Debar is the Hebrew word that God chooses to represent his word. Okay, It's going to be in accordance with the power of the word of God working in our lives. And in accordance with the promises made in the word of God. So there's the very beginning. The very th first three verses of Joshua. You can see what that's all about, can't you? So it gives you the idea. So the first 12 chapters of the book of Joshua are going to take us through the work of, of Jesus Christ at his second advent, in which we are going to be intimately involved. So here's the summary of what we're going to try and cover here in this first study. Joshua 3 and 4 is about Israel crossing Jordan. In the type, it represents the baptism of the Spirit, the saints being immortalized in Christ. And we're going to have a look at Joshua 5. And we're going to see Israel circumcised for the second time. We're going to see its relevance to you and me. We will see the manna cease because the word of God in probation will no longer be required as it is today once we have been immortalized. We will see Joshua encounter Michael the archangel and they are identified as one. And we'll see what that represents, because the next chapter in Joshua is Joshua 6. And Joshua 6 is the Armageddon chapter of this prophecy. So we'll come, you'll see that the exact order. Now look, the thing about prophecy is this. There is a framework. Our pioneers uncovered that framework. If you don't understand that framework, you're not going to understand passages of Scripture like this. But if you have some knowledge of that framework, you're going to see the precision. The absolute precision of the way that the types presented that's how we know it's inspired and that's how we know it's right so you're not going to hear opinions from me from this platform you will not hear opinions you'll hear the word of god if the word of god can't explain itself then i'm not doing my job 
It's as simple as that. Let it explain itself, and it will, as we shall see. So what about this Jordan? Well, as I said, Jordan means the descender. And it sets forth a parable, a graphic parable of the problems of human nature. And you'll notice that this picture here, you can see the serpentine course of the river. Right, it lies there like a serpent. Okay, you got the idea of that? And we're going to see that it represents the problem that we have. You know, Paul made the statement, in Adam all die. And we read about the city of Adam. If you come to Joshua chapter 3, Joshua 3 and verse 16 says that the waters of Jordan rose up on a heap very far from the city of Adam. Now I wonder why that's tucked in there. Well, because it's obvious, isn't it? What we have is a parable here. Due to Adam's sin, human life inexorably descends a serpentine course to an inevitable death. So it goes from the sea of life up here. The waters of Hermon, the snows of Hermon melt. They run down into the Sea of Galilee, which is teeming with life. Okay, there's the Sea of Life. And then you've got this serpentine course passing by Adam. And you end up in the Dead Sea. If you've ever been to the Dead Sea and swum in it, you know that nothing lives in there. Absolutely nothing. It's as dead as a doornail. Okay? And that's the parable of human life. It goes from life through the problem of, of sin, the serpent within, because of Adam, to death, to the dead sea. And only the atoning work of Christ could reverse that process. We're going to see this dramatically portrayed in Joshua chapter 3. And his success guarantees, of course, the salvation of Israel, the crossing over of his people into the land of promise. That's the graphic parable presented. Very simple, really. But it's a graphic parable of what the truth is all about and why we have been called to it and where we're going, brothers and sisters. This is what it makes it, makes it so marvellous for us. So let's then come and have a bit of a more detailed look at Joshua chapter 3. Joshua 3 and verse 1. And Joshua, Yahshua, remember, he's the type of Christ. Joshua rose early in the morning. What does that sound like to you? Well, it sounds like our Lord Jesus Christ rising from the dead to me. And that's, of course, what it does represent in the scheme of things. He rises from the dead as the guarantee of the salvation of others. And then we read this. And they removed from Shittim. Now this word removed in the Hebrew, Nassar, means to pull up tent pegs and to start a journey. Now, of course, you live in tents because you're a pilgrim. You know, we don't live in tents, do we? But we are pilgrims. We are in probation. This is talking about Israel who've come to the borders of the land. This is, as it were, the end of their probation. They're pulling up the tent pegs. They're going from their sojourn in the wilderness of life, like you and I are in the wilderness of life now, to a permanent inheritance in the land. That's where we're going. See, so this is the type, brothers and sisters, being presented. And it says that they removed from Shittim. Now, Shittim actually means the acacia tree. In the Hebrew, it's in the noun feminine. And it just so happens that this, this word shittim occurs five times in the Old Testament. And five, we know, is the number of divine grace. So here we've got Israel pulling up their tent pegs to come to the end of their probation, to cross over the Jordan, and to go into their permanent inheritance. What's that going to be on the basis of, do you think? Divine grace. Yes. And we know that the, the Ark of the Covenant was made from Shittim wood. Exodus 25 and verse 10. It represents the Israel of God. They're now ready to enter the promised land. That's how Joshua chapter 3 begins. This is the baptism of the Spirit in type, brothers and sisters. And it says they came to Jordan in verse 1 for the baptism of the Spirit, of which we have spoken in John 3, verses 5 and 6. And they lodged there before they passed over, it says at the end of verse 1. And so we will, we will lodge before we pass over. And of course this word pass over is a bar, to cross over, to cross over into a new experience, into the experience of immortality. But we'll pause before that happens. You know why? Because there has to be the judgment seat of Christ. And there's a process that has to be gone through that will precede the glorification of the saints. 
before they pass over. Now that word dominates uh, Joshua 3 and 4. It's there 23 times in these two chapters because it's all about that crossing over into immortality in the type. And then we read in verse 2 that it came to pass after three days. Interesting, isn't it? That it should be three days. Because we know that our Lord Jesus Christ, as it were, went three days in advance of us. Do you remember when they left Sinai in the, in the second month after they came out of Egypt, that it says that the Ark of the Covenant went before them for the first three days? That's Numbers chapter 10, by the way, verse 33 and onwards. Why did the Ark go before Israel for the first three days and then for the rest of the journey went back into the centre of Israel when they moved? Well, because it's telling us that Christ went before us. Three days journey, so to speak. He was three days and three nights in the grave. And when he came out, he was immortalized, brothers and sisters. Yes, there's the pattern that was set. He goes before his brethren. It says in verse 2, that the officers went through the host. And this is the type of the angels who will perform the work of judgment with our Lord Jesus Christ. We know how often they are spoken of in that role. Matthew 25, verse 31, he comes with his holy angels. Matthew 13, verses 41 to 42, and many other passages tell us that the angels are going to have the primary role in the judgment process. They will do the interviewing. Having brought those responsible to the judgment seat, they will do the interviewing. They will do the marshalling. They will bring contemporary generations before Christ. All he's going to do is wave to the left and or to the right. He's not going to interview anybody. The very most he will do at the judgment seat over a course of 12 months is give one-line answers to people who think they should be going to the right when they're going to the left. They will say, Lord, Lord, depart from me, I never knew you. That's all he's going to say. It'll be left to the angels, brothers and sisters, to do most of the work. And they will be the ones who will shuffle off those rejected. And then they will do their last work. Their last work will be to take this glorified multitude on the right and to instruct them for four and a half years in the things that they will do. And then they will retire. This is why it says here, you see, this is the type. The officers went through the host. It's about to happen. Our angels are going to turn up at our doorstep. There'll be two come to my house because there's two responsible people. They'll be knocking on my door and on yours. If I'm in Australia, it'll be 15 or 14 hours before they knock on yours. Okay? But they're coming, brothers and sisters, and the officers will go through the host. This is before we pass over. This is before the baptism of the Spirit. That has to come first. And it's signified there in verse 2. Let's read on. They commanded, verse 3, the people saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of Yahweh your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet, he says, there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way hitherto, hitherto or heretofore. A very, very important verse in the book of Joshua. Because, you see, this 2,000 cubits represents the 2,000 years since Christ rose from the dead and was glorified to the time of our redemption. And there's a principle that you can find. I'm not going to take you to Revelation 14, verse 20, but you'll remember that it says, by the space of 1,600 furlongs. That's actually a space of time. And so it is here. The space here it represents time, 2,000 years. Come not near unto it, he says. Now the ark, of course, was standing in Jordan when the priest took it in there and represented Christ's victory over mortality. But ours has got to wait, brothers and sisters. It's got to wait for 2,000 years after his triumph over mortality. That's what this is about. So what we have here is a parable. So here's our dirty, muddy Jordan, which overflows its banks all the time of the harvest. That's why it's sort of like that terrible brown colour. Okay? This, is, this is human nature, isn't it? Going from the sea of life to the sea of death, and this is what happens. The priests take the ark in. All right? they, they crossed it in flood time. They take the ark into the lip of this Jordan. And it's Passover time. Isn't that interesting? Passover time. 
the time when, of course, the redemption of Israel occurred. So what, what happens here is that this water was passing through Adam, the source of all man's ills. So the priest went in here, and 2,000 cubits downstream, this is where Israel was to cross once the Jordan had flowed backwards and they could walk across a virtually dry riverbed. Okay, it's 2,000 years downstream. This is the imagery that is being portrayed before us. And then you read in verse 16 these words, Joshua 3 verse 16, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam. Yes, Adam is the cause of all the problems, brothers and sisters. In Romans 5 verse 12, as we'll point out again this evening, God willing, he is the one that is held responsible for the introduction of sin and of death. He wasn't the first one to transgress. But he's held responsible for it because he did it with open eyes. He knew what he was doing. He made the choice of a woman over God. Okay? He knew what he, and that's why he becomes culpable, responsible for the introduction of sin and death into the world. So these waters of Jordan, which represent human life going down to the, to the Dead Sea, now go backwards. Why do they go backwards? Because of the work of Jesus Christ, represented by the ark that's carried by the priests into the Jordan. And the waters go back, and they go back through Adam. He's reversing the process. But we've got to wait. We've got to wait for 2,000 years downstream from that great work, brothers and sisters, and we know we're about 2,000 years downstream, don't we? Yes. So our day is at hand. Our day for the baptism of the Spirit will shortly come. What a wonderful time that will be. You know, it says in verse 16, the city of Adam that is beside Zaratan. Now, Zaratan means their distress. And that's been the state, isn't it, of all folk who are in Adam. It is, it is a time of distress because this nature we bear is constantly inclined towards sin. We do our absolute best to allow the truth to work in our life. And guess what we find? We find, like the Apostle Paul, that when we would do good, evil is present with us. We, we, we yearn. We yearn for the day when we'll put off this nature, brothers and sisters, of all of the stress that it's brought to us and to our world and to our brotherhood. The day is coming, and this is all prefigured here, when that water will flow backwards. You know what's going to happen in the kingdom age? When the earthquake has completely reshaped that land, the Dead Sea, which is now 1,300 feet below sea level, is going to come above sea level. You know that? And the water is going to flow north. And it's going, out, it's going to go out. It's going to go out into the Mediterranean through the Valley of Jezreel, we believe. The process is going to be reversed, see? And that's the work of the saints in the millennial age. It will be to instruct and to educate people that they might take hold of the things that we have taken hold of and that they might have the same end that they might come to immortality, that God might be glorified and be all and in all. That's the work of the millennium that you and I will shortly undertake by the grace of God. That's what this is all about. Can you see how marvellous this type is? We've only just begun. We're going to see a lot more as we proceed in our studies over the course of this next two days. So let's come and have a look at verse 4. What does it mean in verse 4? when it says that ye might know the way by which ye must go. Let's just read that again. He says, Come not near unto it, that is, you've got to be 2,000 cubits downstream, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. What does he mean by that, in terms of this grand type that is here? Well, he means this, brothers and sisters. Christ's example must be in clear view for those who will follow him ultimately into life. Now, that was 2,000 years ago. He says, come not, well, of course we can't come near it, 2,000 years ago. But we must keep him in view. Just like Israel could look north, and they could see those priests in the distance, 2,000 cubits north. They could see the priests, they're standing in the Jordan. Like the Son of God resisted the power of sin, and ultimately was victorious over sin and death. We've got to keep that in view. Because we haven't been this way before, as it were. You have not passed this way heretofore. 
yesterday and the day before. The literal translations say that, that that should be rendered. No one has received eternal life since Christ was glorified, but the day's coming. We haven't passed this way, have we? We haven't crossed over the baptism of the Spirit, but it's, it's coming. That's the message here. And then he says this in verse 5. Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves. Yes, kadash in the Hebrew. It means to keep oneself apart or separate, to cause himself to be hallowed. That is of God. It's the key, of course, to acceptance, isn't it? In the first of Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, we have the, the appeal of the apostle Peter when he says, quoting from the Old Testament, Be ye holy, says God, for I am holy. And Peter chimes in and he says, Gird up the loins of your mind. All right? There has to be this sanctification. That's, that's fundamental to entry into the land of promise, brothers and sisters. It's not optional. It's fundamental that we be a separate people in our thinking and in our behaviour. And so verse 5, we read, that Yahweh will do wonders among you. And I don't think there's any greater wonder than taking the nature that we bear and changing it into the very nature of God himself. Won't that be marvellous? And it's all going to happen at the same time. So when Christ turns, while well, he's still got those on the left who are rejected and who are gnashing their teeth, who will see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob go into the kingdom, and he turns to those on the right and says, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they're all changed at the same time. And they were bouncing around. Can you imagine just standing there like jerks? Thinking, oh, that was nice to be made into a mortal. But what will you be doing? I know what I'll be doing. Leaping like Abraham leapt when he saw Christ's day. Leaping for joy. And you can imagine that the singing of praise at that time amongst this people. Yeah, he's going to do wonders amongst his people. And you and I have been called to these things, brothers and sisters. I don't feel worthy of that, neither do you. But we have been called to it. And if we remain faithful to the end, we will be there to experience these marvellous things together. And it will be because of what our God has done through his Son. It says here in, 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 uh, in this passage, that the ark, verse 6 it says, Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass over before the people. It typified all that God accomplished in Christ. He, of course, is represented in Romans 3.25 and Hebrews 9 and verses 4 and 5 as the mercy seat. Here he is as the mercy seat. And we're all, of course, part of him because from the same piece of gold that, was, that the mercy seat was made out of, so were the cherubim who looked down upon it with the Shekinah glory, the presence of God in their midst, represents Christ and the saints in glory. That is the marvellous picture that we see here in type of the saints entering in to the kingdom, into their inheritance in the land, because they've been made immortal. In verse 7 we read, And Yahweh said to Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel. To make great, the word means. It's the type, of course, of Christ's resurrection to glory, which will be seen in all its magnificence when he appears again. We, of course, magnify the work of our God in Christ today. We remember it every week, brothers and sisters, but we are going to see him soon. And we are going to have the opportunity to do what the whole world will one day do. And we will be the first cab off the rank. We will be the ones who will be there to give praise and glory and honour to our Lord Jesus Christ for what God has achieved in him for our sake. That's what that's talking about in the type. Well, that's Joshua chapter 3. That's all you're going to get from me on Joshua 3. Why don't you come to Joshua 5? This is on the same, <clears throat> the same essential subject. It's about Israel's second, second circumcision. And look what's happening around them, brothers and sisters. While this is going on, while you and I will be at the judgment seat of Christ and being judged and then immortalised and prepared for the work to come, what do you think is going to be happening in the world around us? Well, we spoke about that last night. The horrendous things of that time of trouble such as never was. Well, have a look at verse 1 of Joshua 5. It says this, 
And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that Yahweh had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. Divine activity causes men's hearts to fail for fear. We see that now, but Luke 21, of course, is not really about now. It's about the time when we're removed to the judgment seat of Christ. If you think men's hearts are failing them for fear today, then it's going to be far, far worse when you and I are taken to the judgment seat of Christ. Their hearts will be melting. They'll hear certain things. They won't know the detail. They'll hear, of course, that all these people have disappeared. They won't be too worried about that because they'll be too concerned with survival themselves. Okay? But they'll know these things. There's something going on. And their hearts will be melting for the things that they can see coming on the earth. That's how we read Joshua chapter 5 verse 1. Because this is about our immortalization in this chapter. This is what's going on at the judgment seat. While the world around us has, has been brought into utter darkness by the removal of the only light that remained. Look at verse 2 of Joshua 5. At that time Yahweh said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. You know, it says, at that time. That sounds a bit to me like Daniel 12 verse 1. You know what Daniel 12 verse 1 says? And at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation upon the earth, and at that time many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. The repetition of the phrase, and at that time, tells you that they're concomitant events. The resurrection of the dead, the removal of the responsible to judgment, that's when the time of trouble begins. And at that time, it says in verse 2, Yahweh said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives. Now there are two words in the Hebrew here, Zor Kereb. Kerebs are used again in this chapter, in verse 13, where it's rendered in the King James as sword. You know, so it's got to do with the spirit, hasn't it? The sword of the spirit, Hebrews 4.12. So take sharp knives or flint knives. What are they going to be used for? Well, circumcision. And it says here, circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Now, circumcision is the biblical symbol for baptism. I want you to join me, if you can, in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, Paul's going to explain what circumcision is. Now this is, you know, you can read this, can't you, and think, well, circumcision, that only involves men, males. Forget it. This circumcision involves male and female equally, brothers and sisters. And Paul's going to explain that to us in Colossians chapter 2. So here in Colossians 2, we're going to start with verse 11. He says this. <clears throat> Well, maybe just uh, step back to, to get the idea of who he's talking about here. Have a look uh, at verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So he's talking about Christ and, and Christ's role in our life. Verse 11, he says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That is, you don't have to go to a doctor for this circumcision. Not, it, you know, it's not in, in a doctor's surgery, is it? It's the circumcision made with our hands. What does he mean? In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. You get the idea of this? So baptism into Christ is a circumcision. So my first circumcision in that spiritual sense and yours was when you got baptized. That's when we were, that's when we were circumcised spiritually for the first time. But the second is about to come. The second will come at the judgment seat. Because at the judgment seat when Christ turns to those on his right and changes their nature, what's going to happen? The flesh will be cut off for good. Wait a now, that's a real circumcision, isn't it? The flesh cut off for good. So that's going to be our second circumcision. So you see, Israel was circumcised first time. 
Now they're going to be circumcised a second time. Just like you and I will be circumcised a second time when the flesh is put away forever. That's what this is about in the type. So let's come back and have a look at Joshua 5. They circumcised the people. When you come to Joshua 5 and verse 8, it says this. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people. You notice it doesn't say all the males? <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? You only, you only circumcise males. It doesn't say that. Because this is about the circumcision that we are talking about, that Paul's talking about. This is about putting off human nature. Look what it says at the end of verse 8. But they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. Well, it just so happens that that word is kaya. Kaya doesn't mean to be whole. It means to live. Till they lived. Can you elevate that to the spiritual realm? Yeah. You can, can't you? Because it's talking about immortality. Till they lived. So this second circumcision is a baptism of the spirit. It's being made immortal in the presence of Yahshua. Yahweh's salvation who organizes this second circumcision of Israel. And then we read what it leads to in verse 9. And Yahweh said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Now Gilgal of course means, doesn't it, to roll away. And that's what's going to happen when our nature is changed. The reproach of Egypt. It, of course, is a reference to mortality. Can you recall that in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26, that Yahweh says to Israel, I'll put upon you none of the diseases of Egypt, right? He is Yahweh Rafika. I'm going to put upon you none of the diseases of Egypt. Well, I got a disease of Egypt when I was born. So did you. You got a disease of Egypt. The house of sin and death, okay? It's all going to be changed. It's going to be rolled away. When our nature is changed at the judgment seat of Christ. What a wonderful type that is, eh? Well, what happens then? We're going to see. Your goal there, you can see, means, means rolling away. Type of the place where our nature is changed. At Mount Sinai it will be, brothers and sisters, before we make our entrance into the land. And what time of the year is this? Well, it's Passover. Look at verse 10. The children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. Now, of course, the Passover we commemorate, don't we? The first Passover, as it were, in the upper room, when Christ kept the Passover, he being the Passover lamb. Paul picks that up in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 8. He says, even Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Okay, yep, we're going to be celebrating in the presence of the one who brought all of this to pass, brothers and sisters, commemorating our release from Egypt, final release from Egypt. Won't that be a wonderful day? So what happens then? Well, look at verse 12. It says this, And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. So what does manna represent? Well, Exodus 16 speaks eloquently about that. Manna, of course, represents the word of God, the bread of heaven, angels' food, or as it should really be rendered, the food of the mighty in the psalm. It represents the word of God. That's why the word debar occurs in noun and verb form seven times in Exodus chapter 16. So it represents the word of God, which we desperately need today, brothers and sisters. We cannot, we cannot live our lives properly today without the word of God. It is the only thing that generates faith and maintains faith. And without faith, you're going nowhere. The word of God is critical to us today, is it not? But when you're immortal, you're not going to need it in the same way. You'll still study it. You'll still be searching its depths. But you're not going to need it to generate faith like it's needed today. That's why in the type, you see, it ceases. When Israel eats the old corn of the land, the manna ceases. Because at the, the, at the end of their probation, they're gone into the land. What a wonderful type that is. And so we're looking to the day when that will be the case, when the saints have been made, the Word made flesh, like our Lord Jesus Christ was presented, the Word made flesh in immortality. The, the, the Word won't be needed in quite the same way.
It says they ate of the fruit of the land. In immortality, the saints will enjoy, of course, the fruits of the land promised to Abraham. And then we read in verse 13 of Joshua chapter 5, that it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man, and the word man in the Hebrew is ish, there stood a great man <coughs> over against him with his sword, is that word we met earlier in the chapter, his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And we, he's going to find out very quickly who this one is. Because he's told, he's told to take his shoes off in verse 15. You know, that's what Moses was told at the bush, remember? Get your shoes off. You know why? Because this was Michael the archangel. He's described in Isaiah 63 verse 9 as the angel of Yahweh's presence. When Michael is there, you're in God's presence, so to speak. Get your shoes off. The place where you stand is holy ground. Excuse me? He's standing outside Jericho. Jericho is one of the most corrupt places in the land of Canaan. It's devoted to utter destruction. What makes it holy? The presence of Michael the archangel. And what will make this earth holy, brothers and sisters? Very unholy now, isn't it? The presence of Michael, your prince, of Daniel 12, verse 1. He's coming. And when he comes, the earth's going to know something different, aren't they? They're going to know what it's like to be in the presence of God. And so we see in this type the presentation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's allied, of course. He's aligned, identified with Yahshua, Joshua, because they're actually one. Joshua, the type of Christ. Okay, Michael, the type of Christ. They're brought together in one here. And the sword, of course, is the sword of the imminent divine judgments that are about to fall upon humanity. He describes himself in verse 14 as the captain, the captain of the host of he who will become. Yes, and so our Lord Jesus Christ is. That word captain is sar, prince, the ruler. It's the word, of course, that we find elsewhere uh, of Michael, your prince, Daniel 10, 13 and Daniel 12. Verse 1. And the host, of course, is the host of heaven who are going to be replaced in their duties upon the earth very shortly by another host made up of immortalized brethren of our Lord Jesus Christ. This place was holy ground, an unholy place made holy by the presence of our God. That's the wonderful type, brothers and sisters, of Joshua 3 to 5. And we are about to see the reality of these things. Let us make sure. Let us make sure in what few days remain that we turn to the word of God on a daily basis to generate and to maintain the faith that will ultimately see us there to make these things a reality.